Welcome everyone to this special interview with MBA veteran Myers Leonard brought to you by AISH and Clean Speech. My name is Elliot Mathias. I'm the CEO Global of AISH and I'm also a very big basketball fan. So I'm really excited for this interview that we're gonna be having today with Myers. First of all, I wanna encourage all of you, whether you're watching this on YouTube or you're listening to it on your favorite podcast platform, follow us, subscribe to the H channel. You can get all kinds of amazing H content that we're putting out all the time on all different types of topics having to do with Jewish topics, other topics. So please follow us, subscribe, uh, and you can get the rest of our great content that comes out all the time. Today's conversation with Myers Leonard is not only sponsored by H, but it's also brought to you together with Clean Speech. Clean Speech is an amazing initiative that H has been partner participating in uh, for the last couple of years. And joining me in this interview is, is Alexandra Feingold, who is the coordinator for Clean Speech in New York and New Jersey. We're going to bring Alexandra in right now to tell us just for a minute all about Clean Speech. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Rabbi Matthias. I'm so excited to be here tonight. Clean Speech, for those who don't know, is a 30-day journey to mindful speech in which participants receive short daily videos with Jewish tools for positive speech. We are so proud to have had over 3,000 people across New York and New Jersey sign up to improve their speech this past year. And we had over 50 participating organizations, schools, and synagogues, including AISH across New York and New Jersey. And after this interview, if you're feeling inspired and you're interested to start working on your own speech and speak more positively, you can sign up for a 30-day detox from negative speech at cleanspeech.com slash NYC. Amazing. Okay. And, and I think everyone's going to see as we, as we jump into this conversation, why Clean Speech uh, is sponsoring this to get today with Aish. This is going to be a conversation that's going to be very much uh, about the words that we use. And, and it's, I think it's going to be a really, really fascinating conversation. So thank you, Alexandra, for joining me. Um, Myers Leonard uh, is an MBA veteran. He was uh, chosen 11 years ago in the MBA draft with the uh, 11th pick of the draft by the Portland Trailblazers. He has played for the Miami Heat, the Milwaukee Bucks, not for my Chicago Bulls, who I'm a big fan for, but still, uh, he has been an NBA player on multiple teams. His unique combination of size, talent, and athleticism has really made him a prized prospect from an early age and taken him now to the highest level of the NBA, the National Basketball Association. About two years ago, in March 2021, Myers uttered one word that literally changed his life. He uttered an anti-Semitic slur and it was caught on video and it went viral. The whole world was focused on Myers Leonard and not for a good reason. It was front page news. But I think the story of Myers Leonard and why I'm so excited about this conversation today, why we wanted to bring him on is not about what happened that day. It's about what happened afterwards and how he responded to it and how he has become someone who I think in so many ways is a role model, someone for us to learn with from. And we're really, really excited to have the conversation. Welcome, Myers Leonard. Hey, thank you guys for having me. Um, I just am so grateful. I have learned a great deal throughout my life, of course, but certainly over these last two years, it, it hasn't been easy, but it's been so transformative for me and so enlightening in so many ways. And the worst mistake of my life has somehow turned into a positive. And we'll, we'll jump into that. Certainly a very negative moment and one that still hurts very bad to this day. Always will, because I want everyone to love me. I don't hate anybody. And again, we'll jump into all of this. But I, again, I made a very big mistake. I'm, I am and always will be extremely sorry uh, for what happened. But I am very thankful for everything that I've learned, the people that I've met, um, and just, I guess, where I'm sitting at today, I feel good as a man. And that's, I didn't know that I would ever get here, if I'm being honest, when I was going through those dark days uh, sure. early on in March sure. uh, I'm 21. Sure. I'm sure. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to jump into that. But before we do, mm. I want to just, um, we have a lot of people who are watching, are basketball fans, they're Myers Leonard fan. I wanted to just to, to know a little bit about you. So first of all, you're from Illinois, right, originally? Okay, so am I. I grew up, I grew up outside of Chicago. Like I said, I'm a Chicago Bulls fan. 
You didn't not not uh, you haven't gotten there yet. Maybe we'll see. You still got time in your career. Mm -hmm. But you but you went to school at University of Illinois. I remember when you were you were a player at University of Illinois, right? For two years. Right. And you, did you grow you where did you grow up in Illinois? So I grew up in a small town in the southeastern part of Illinois, right on the border of Illinois and Indiana. I um, I mean, there's less than seven thousand people. Uh, wow. blue, blue collar people, hardworking people, loving people. Uh, I wouldn't change where I come from for any reason. And um, so I grew up loving sports. I tried to play everything, which, by the way, for any parent or any kid that's listening, I think that's important. This is totally off, off topic, but I want to say it. Try not to specialize in, in a certain sport until you're a little bit older. It helps your athleticism. It teaches you how to be on team. It teaches you different types of athleticism, catching a baseball, dunking a basketball, throwing a football, trying to hit a golf ball, whatever it may be. I think that's very important. So that takes me, let's go to my freshman year of high school. I played zero minutes of varsity basketball, zero. Uh, I was 6'4", uh, well, excuse me, 6'1", coming into my freshman year. And by the end of my freshman year, I had grown uh, nine inches in 12 months. Wow. So that was a huge growth spurt, obviously. And uh, I decided basically then, well, we don't have any money. I grew up very poor. Uh, my father passed when I was six. Uh, you know, I've had some struggle for sure, uh, but it's built me into the man that I am today. And um, I thought to myself, wow, I might be able to get a, a, you know, a free education. That, that was the only goal at that time. My mother had nothing. My brother, you know, had, had already um, committed to go to the Marine Corps and, and, and be in the service. So my sophomore year, I then started to play varsity. Somehow after my sophomore summer, I blew up on the AAU circuit. I then commit to Illinois after being recruited by basically everybody in the country because here I was a tall athletic kid, pretty good shooting touch. Uh, didn't shoot threes at the time, which is obviously now something I do in the NBA. But long story short, I ended up going to University of Illinois. I didn't play any my freshman year. I mean, barely any. I played, I think, 9.1 minutes. I averaged 2.1 points and like 1.9 rebounds. I was, wow. I was not but a very good player. But you were a big recruit. I mean, people I were, was. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was top 25, top 30 in the nation. I was just barely left out of the uh, McDonald's All-American game. So, you know, again, I kind of had to look myself in the mirror and be like, oh, man, I got I got to work harder. I got to be prepared for, you know, whatever comes my way. Then all of a sudden, my sophomore year, I had a very good um, season. And um, yeah, all of a sudden I was drafted into the NBA. Uh, you know, I, they say, you know, people have a high ceiling or whatever it may be. I was a young athletic kid, seven feet tall. And what I showed most importantly at the draft combine was that I could shoot. And um, that's what led me to you know, getting drafted 11th, like you said, by the Portland Trailblazers in 2012. Um, seven years in Portland, two years in Miami. And then we had, you know, the unfortunate incident and injuries, which, by the way, I, I do think that's an important thing to bring up. I fully own everything that happened, and it was extremely difficult. And teams knew that um, it was going to be a difficult thing in the media if someone were to, say, bring me to their organization, to their city. And I just – I'm so thankful for the Milwaukee Bucks to say, make calls around the NBA, call people who knew me. And, and, and thankfully everyone spoke very highly of me. I've always treated people with immense respect. Uh, every day when I walk through those doors, I think to myself, how can I work as hard as I possibly can? And how good of a human being can I can, uh, how, how good of a human being can I be? And so that's the, the two things that I will never let um, be questioned when I come in every day to work. And so, like I said, I'm very thankful that even people like Adam Silver, Mike Bass, um, Michael Levine at the NBA, all those people um, were supporting me behind the scenes, even when times were tough. But it was just going to take time to get through that really long stretch of, of negative um, media coverage, if you will. And like I said, I'm so thankful for the Milwaukee Bucks. Um, I'm thankful for everyone who's ever, everyone who's ever believed in me, um, who I guess know and heard my sincere apology and also know of the work that I've done over the last two years and that I will do the rest of my life. Uh, mm -hmm. That is something that will never change. I can assure you of that. I am very proud of it. I, I truly am. I've learned so much, but I've, com I've connected at such a high level with so many people in the Jewish community from rabbis to kids in the community to basketball fans whatever it may be this is really really important to me truly it is it's it's in my heart now and that's why i i know that i've been so blessed through this situation uh i sat in front of 
you know, I know you'll have more questions, but I sat in front of uh, Rabbi Penny down in South Florida at a Chabad uh, 48 hours after everything had happened. And it didn't take five minutes for him, for him to stop me when I am just pouring tears, apologizing for him to say, Myers, I need to tell you something. You're a good man with a good soul. I already know this. Um, I will support you. I will help you. And we will have you meet as many people as you'd like in the Jewish community. And you will learn and you will, you will be better from this. But I want to let you know this happened uh, for you, not to you. Now, as a man, as I've matured, even over these last two years, I understand that. This certainly happened for me. I've learned so much. Like I said, I've met so many amazing people now. Like I said earlier, let me not get long winded and let you guys ask a different question. But yeah, now here I am. Um, I'm in off-season training. I'm in Milwaukee right now, and I'm hopeful to be picked up this summer and continue my MBA career. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing so vulnerably about all that. It's so inspiring. I'm not sure if you know anything about the clean speech campaign and what its aim is, but it's really meant to eradicate hateful speech and divisive speech from our community and pretty much and every every community, really. And so for those who don't know, would you mind sharing a bit about what your personal journey with your struggle with mindful speech was? Sure. OK, so I um, away from the basketball floor, I've always tried to do things such as, you know, give time, um, give money, support as many people and different things as I can throughout my career, because I was uh, supported throughout my childhood when I had nothing. And now I'm in a in a you know, fortunate position in my life. And I know that I can impact people. So I, uh, away from the floor, also really enjoyed video games. And Twitch started to come along, which is a live streaming um, gaming platform, if you will, where you can sit basically and record yourself playing a video game and you react live to what's happening. And one thing I will say in all of the educating uh, for myself that I've done over the last couple of years I knew that language admittedly was really volatile in video games. I've played video games my entire life and I've, I've now come, this is going to open up a whole nother can of worms, but I've come to realize that I use video games to completely numb my mind and take me into exactly what video games are an alternate reality. Uh, because I was struggling with uh, the pressure of being in the NBA. I was struggling with having money and um, seeing people change because of that. I was struggling deep down to the, furthest fiber of my being not having a father growing up and like I said now that I've gone to therapy because of again this happened for me uh, I finally went to therapy I I always thought that I was okay because I've done okay financially I have a, an amazing wife uh, a big house nice cars I play in the NBA everything's supposed to be okay no no everything's not okay so I was live streaming myself playing a video game and as I mentioned uh I'm very aware, and anybody that plays video games is very aware that um, language specifically in games like Call of Duty that are high uh, intensity and, you know, uh, multiplayer games like that, the language is very bad. And I, be I believe and know now that I've spoke to so many people about this, that it kind of poisoned my brain. I am not a bad human being. I believe anybody that has ever spent any amount of time around me would see that immediately. And I, I, I know that in my heart. And I, in a heated moment, used a word completely ignorantly, uh, which unfortunately was an anti-Semitic slur. I will never forget that day. It was actually a Monday. And this is one thing I'm, I'm in, I guess, encouraged a little bit to, to finally kind of tell. It happened on a Monday. And everything actually didn't release on social media until Tuesday. The reason I bring this up is because people would say, well, that would be an alibi of sorts. Well, first of all, I, I, I deserve to be punished and we'll get into that. But I had no idea that it happened. I live streamed on Monday, had no idea that this happened. Wow. Tuesday, I'm live streaming again and I start to get weird calls on my phone and I'm trying not to pay attention um, off to the side. And I'm like, what is happening? So I muted my stream and I answered and it was what's called a moderator of my chat. And he said, Myers, you need to end your stream right now. Something is not OK. And I said, what do you mean? He said, no, no, really end your stream. So I said uh, it was a bit of a fib. I said, my wife needs something, guys. I'm so sorry. I got to go. And I looked up my name on Twitter and I was like, oh, my gosh. I mean, I'm about to start crying. I was like, what is oh, my Lord, what is going to happen to my to my life? 
I ended the stream. I walked out. I said to my wife, who was on a business call at the time, I said, honey, you got to hang up. Please, please, please. No, no, I can't hang up. I said, no, please, you, you need to hang up. So she hangs up. She said, what is wrong? I said, I think I just made a really big mistake. Do you know what this word means? She, she said, I don't know. No, show me your phone. So I turn around. She says, no, look it up. And then my phone, then it's my agent. And then it's the heat. And then it's, and it just, I just remember, I'm getting goosebumps. I just remember thinking, oh my gosh, what have I done? I feel like I've ruined my life. And my world just started to crash in around me. And so that's, that's the story as it goes. Um, and when you I, said, Ma Myers, did you, you didn't even remember saying it? Meaning when you saw the video the next day, did you remember that you said it? It was, it was just so off the cuff. It just had just sort of came out. Yeah. Wow. Unfortunately, it was just... I, I, and again, I've talked to therapists about this. I've talked to, you know, mindfulness coaches of sorts. Like, how could this ever happen? They said, look, you just played for so long listening to such bad. I mean, I, honestly, I have an, a bit of an a, a obsessive personality. That's why I love to, you know, I'm a perfectionist when, when it comes to shooting on the basketball court. Uh, ever, I've never played video games since the day that happened, by the way. Not a lot of people know that either. That's uh, I, I was like that almost ruined my life. Never doing that again. Now I play guitar almost literally every day of my life for two straight years. I played probably, I don't know, four to eight hours, four to eight hours a day, long, long time every day. Um, so I just know that all of those hours, uh, just poisoned my brain. And so, yeah, a very unfortunate moment. I want to say again, I'm sorry. I own it. Um, I'm still learning. I will continue to learn. I'll continue to have an impact on as many people as I can and just say we have to be so aware of what we're saying, um, who we're surrounding ourselves with, and that language, whether it seems really small or not, can really hurt people and is very, very important to be mindful of. So I'm, I'm really curious because that idea that you didn't even really realize that you said it, I, I assume, I mean, tell me if this is true, that now you probably become much more aware of other people's comments, right? You're surround, we're all surrounded by people who say things off the cuff, who make comments. And now because of your situation, probably much more aware. How, where do you think it comes? I mean, you, you're I, obviously you've done a lot of self-analysis of where it came from for you. When you see other people and they make hurtful comments, when they say derogatory things, have you sort of processed in your mind, like, where is this coming from for other people? Like why? And, and especially when, when, like you said, other people don't I would say they're not conscious of it, or, but they're but they're they're not necessarily trying to hurt someone. But yet yet it comes up. Where, where is this coming from? Such an important question. So, I, again, I've done a lot of digging and try to understand. Um, and I heard something interesting on a podcast and it said that. And it makes sense to me. You guys could maybe uh, give your opinion. Ignorance and hate can look oddly similar. Mm -hmm. And they're almost like cousins. I think that's what they said on the podcast. And it's the truth. It's almost what you're saying. People, whether they mean to say it or they unconsciously say something, in the moment, they're not trying to hurt somebody. It's not like I, for example... Uh, since I've learned about Shabbat, uh, it's not like I was in LA or, or some big city and I see, you know, a, a Jewish family walking down the street and I scream something at them. Heavens no. And a lot of times, like you're saying, it's, I don't think people, and I can't speak for everybody and this is not a, a definite statement, but I don't think people mean to hurt people all the time. They just say things, whether they're trying to be funny or whether they think it's a, environment where they feel that they can say that and they're not going to be judged. And so that's what I think. I think that education and ignorance is a, a big piece of this um, and that we need to understand that words are powerful and they can hurt and they do hurt. And so that's one thing that I've been more aware of myself is saying, okay, if and when something like that happens in front of me, I have to pick my moments. And there hasn't been a, a ton of them, but there's certainly a handful where I, you know, maybe it's, I know that it's not the right person to bring it up in front of the group, but maybe I pull them aside and I have. I've said, hey, like, you got to think about that. It, you know, maybe it's not something so bad 
that you're going to hurt a ton of people or, but that, that one thing can lead to somebody else hearing it and they think it's okay and so on and so forth. It just leads to unfortunately negative things intentional or not. And that's why I now have the duty really to say, Hey, this happened to me. Please take it from me. My life was almost ruined because of this. Please be more mindful of, of what you're saying and how this can hurt people. And, and it's so powerful. Like you're saying, whether someone has the intention or not, the outcome can be the same, right? From, from, the, from the person hearing it, from the person receiving it, it doesn't really matter if it was intentional or not, right? The, it's, it's still the comment, whatever it might be, the derogatory statement still. And, and, and amazing in, in your situation where you didn't even know you're being filmed, you're, you're in a private room and all of a sudden you know, it gets out there. You really see like the, the power of the words that we can have that we just don't even realize um, can just can just go out there. And in the world today where things are viral, it's just it's pretty unbelievable. Yeah. And you've done so much more than just take responsibility. You've become a role model through positive words, through positive actions. Can you share with us what you learned through the positive things that you've done to make up for this? Sure, I'd love to. And as I mentioned, this is not a uh, like ends today kind of thing. This is a lifelong thing for anybody who needs help in some way from Myers Leonard, because I always want to help as many people as I can until I leave this earth. And so, uh, like I mentioned, uh, everything happened on technically Monday, but it blew up on Tuesday, Tuesday night. This is an interesting story. So I throughout my career have met people along the way, of course, fans of the NBA. Maybe I have a city where I don't know anybody, but I got connected to um, a former rabbi and his son in Toronto. He goes by Shuli and Shuli and I have been, become close friends. I had left him tickets probably three or four years in a row. And the last time, well, next to last time, because I just played the last game of the season uh, this year in Toronto, but uh, I, I had left them tickets and uh, Shuli said to me, Myers, uh, my son's uh, bar mitzvah is in a couple of days. Would you mind signing some shoes and leaving them at the hotel for me? I know you guys got to leave after the game. I said, Shuli, I'd love to, of course. And so we had this real genuine relationship. I wasn't thinking to myself, you know, is, is he this person or that person or Jewish or, or not? Doesn't matter to me. We had a real relationship. And so Shuli called me immediately, uh, say an hour after everything kind of went viral. He said, Myers, I know, I mean, I was crying and crying and crying. He said, Myers, you're going to be okay. I promise. I will connect you with people in the community. And I actually have a brother-in-law who is a, a big rabbi. He does the, um, the Heach Jewish Heritage Night, still does. Uh, rabbi Penny down in, as I mentioned, down in South Florida, um, and I want to connect you with him. I will speak highly of you because that is the man you are and you should speak to him. So we spoke um, Wednesday, the next day, Penny and I did. And he said to me, Mars, would you be willing to meet in person? I said, well, gosh, yes, I'd love to. And I'll also mention that at the time, unfortunately, and for about a year after, um, my wife was also brutally being attacked on social media. You know, I was receiving, of course, all the death threats and such. And the hardest part for me was that my wife and my friends and people that I loved were also being attacked. And people were threatening to rape and murder my wife and all sorts of things. It was extremely ugly and it hurt bad. We don't take this the wrong way. Lived in a gated community, but we still needed 24 hour security outside of our house. Uh, they were doing sweeps in my house every hour on the hour through the night. I mean, it was it was bad. And I got so uncomfortable that the morning I was Thursday morning that I was going to go meet with uh, Rabbi Penny. I had to I had to fly my wife back to Illinois because I was that scared. And so I just remember feeling so lonely. And on that drive, I cried the whole way there from Miami up to the Boca Raton area for about an hour. And I, I remember getting about I looked at my GPS and I was probably three minutes away. And I said, Myers, put yourself together. Everything's okay. Take a deep breath. Go show him the man you are. Show him your heart and tell him and prove to him that you're willing to do whatever it takes to right this wrong. And so I remember pulling up into to the little gravel drive there at the Chabad and looking out my windshield and frankly, seeing probably the most religious man that I was probably ever about to meet in my life. 
And I just took a deep breath and I turned my truck off and there I went and I walked in. And as I said, we got about five minutes in. He said, Myers, you know, this didn't happen to you. It happened for you. And we had a beautiful conversation, Penny and I. Penny and I are still close, very close. Uh, I saw him when I was just in Miami. I, he came to um, one of the playoff games and um, so many other people who I've, who I've made great uh, relationships with, uh, excuse me, in the Jewish community came to the game. And, um, you know, we, let's see, I also want to mention uh, Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg, Boca Raton Synagogue. We did a basketball camp there. Uh, uh, I got to meet the kids and I, 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 the most important part to me was standing in front of them with a microphone and I cried, you know, and he gave me such a beautiful, um, intro and i was like gosh i don't even feel like i deserve this but you know thank you and i just remember speaking to them and opening it up for questions and having this and and, and to this day i want to say this the most beautiful thing and most loving thing that i feel and have felt is the love and compassion and grace from the jewish community period i have just been wrapped up in these arms like it's okay you made a mistake we love you we will support you you're going to be okay and that's the thing that i've been most thankful for no question about it and so that was an amazing day having parents come to me and say myers you made a mistake it's okay we all make mistakes um you know let's see i, I visited the holocaust memorial in miami beach a, an amazing powerful day i met it that was the first time just after that, I met a survivor and I just, he sat and told my wife and I his story. And I remember thinking to myself, this man has more courage than probably anybody I have ever met in my life. And I just remember being just so taken away by uh, that, his courage and his willingness to continue to speak and um, to schools in the area, to my wife and I, um, and have such a profound impact on people based upon his experiences. Um, I did a Passover event with Penny, which was beautiful. We, we delivered meals and uh, I got to sit with uh, yet another survivor and hear her story. And then another, so it's just like, I know I'm probably reiterating things, but it's important to me. And it's just been so, the thing about it is, is we can all, sure, we can read a book or go online and, and read about, you know, the Holocaust and all these things horrific things that have happened but when you feel that when you're sitting in person across from somebody who has gone through so much and yet here they are showing love and compassion and i just think to myself i i i can't be anything other than so thankful and grateful and so I, I'm, I'm leaving so many people out that i'm going to feel guilty matthew hiltzik and his entire team so thankful for them um uh, I want to get to the next question, but if I left you out, I'm so sorry. We I've had so many amazing experiences. Uh, you can go look at Jeremy Schaff and I. Uh, we had an amazing interview set down. Uh, there's other things on my Instagram about things that I've done uh, in the community and will continue to do. In fact, I have a speaking event uh, with young um, Jewish people in the Milwaukee community uh, this Thursday night. So, or I guess. So it's, it's a continuing thing. And I'm, I'm very, very honestly lucky and, and proud to be able to turn a negative into a positive and, and do these sorts of things. Absolutely. And that's what clean speech and Judaism is all about. It's about realizing that we're all human. We all make mistakes. We all say things impulsively, thoughtlessly. And that one word, one negative thing shouldn't define us. And we can turn that negative into a positive of you, of you, as you've done. Yeah, I, th I think, Myers, that's why you have been embraced so much. I mean, I, I've, I've heard about it and I've read it, but just meeting you now and hearing you talk, uh, your openness, your transparency, you're just you're just being genuine. I think people see that. And um, and but I think the story we can all relate to. We've all been in that place where we said, what the heck did I just do? You know, like, I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I did that. Like every human being has uh, have felt that. And our challenge is what do we do next, right? Do we just wallow in that uh, um, anxiety or that embarrassment? Or do we say, okay, there's nothing I can do about what happened. Now I have to decide how I'm going to move forward and, and build something positive. And so I think you've just inspired so many people by doing that. And, uh, and like, like I heard you say it many times, you said it today, right? It didn't happen to you, right? It happened for you. You've used it to build. And so we, we all really appreciate it. I want to take a little bit of a turn. Um, 
um, because you're someone, you know, again, we're talking about speech and we're talking about the impact it has. And so now just maybe to, to turn the tables a little bit, not necessarily your situation, what you said, but you're also often on the receiving end of speech, right? As an NBA player, you're in the spotlight. Um, the media are talking about you all the time. Uh, social media, I'm sure, you know, every, every fan is an expert. I'm sure you probably hear it on the sidelines. Well, I, I mean, I, I can't have imagined, right, how many people are talking about Myers Leonard and even before the incident, right? When you were at Illinois, when you were starting in the NBA. So I'm curious your thoughts and, and even before the incident, but now really feeling the power of speech, how do you handle criticism? Where do you feel uh, it's appropriate for the media you know, to use their platform and their power of words to uh, uh, to talk about you, to talk about you know your your teammates or other NBA players, and where maybe do you feel that line is crossed and it becomes inappropriate? Sure, great question. Uh, this is obviously a very uh, delicate, if you will, topic. But let me start off by saying this: uh, certain players, certain people, whatever level of fame comes with more notoriety, more difficult questions. People want to hear from you, so. I see both sides of it, and I'm going to tell you what I mean. Sometimes a player has a bad game or you know, maybe has a, an incident in the media, and the media, to a certain extent, of course, has every right to ask difficult questions. That's the reality of the world we're living in. Let's be honest. We're making millions of dollars to put an orange ball in an orange rim, okay? <laughs> we're not saving lives. We're not teaching children. We're not doing that sort of thing. We, we live very blessed lives. And so, again, it's delicate. Um, it's sensitive. It's tough. Um, I often say to reporters, like, hey, and I'm sorry the way he treated you. Because, yes, a player may be frustrated, but as long as it's not too in your face or repetitive or disrespectful, sometimes – those difficult things do have to be asked. And I'll, I'll use me for an example, because I don't want to use anybody else. That's I want to use me. When when this happened, the, actually, the night that I spoke to Penny, which was Wednesday, and as I told you, I went to his Chabad on Thursday to, to first meet with him. I remember looking in the mirror, because I knew I was going to have to send my wife home to Illinois because I was just terrified. I said, you you better be a man and go handle this the right way. Show the world your heart as you always have and let them know that this was an ignorant mistake and that you're going to do everything in your power to make this right. I, I just had to look in the mirror as a, as a man and, and own it and make it right and say, Hey, I screwed up and I am so sorry. And I think that's, it's hard and I think that people sometimes, not all the time, sometimes shy away from that and they start pointing the blame or they, you know, and people have said to me, in fact, when I spoke at, at BRS, actually, some people said, well, Myers, that's, come on, this isn't fair. There's other athletes that have done this or people that have done that. And I said, no, no, no. Make sure you hear me when I tell you this. This is my mistake and my mistake alone. I have to own this. I have to accept what happened and go make it right. And so that's how I feel. That's what I knew to do in my heart. And I think that we all could take some ownership. But, you know, in general, it was hard. You know, uh, my best friends and my wife, who, you know, are my biggest supporters and honestly the biggest uh, caretakers of my heart more than just me as a human, because I'm, I'm a softie. I'm a seven foot teddy bear. I want, I want everyone to love me. I love everybody. I cried at my wedding. I bawled at my wedding. Like, I am just a softie. And, there were people that said some pretty ugly things in the media. Now, as I said, there were some higher level folks at the NBA who from behind the scenes were very supportive. Um, and I do, it is, it is hurtful and a bit unfortunate. Um, I guess the links that some people maybe went to when it came to what they felt about me, but make sure we keep this in the clip. Uh, Everyone's entitled to their own opinion. And while it may hurt me, I can't control what they think or what they say. And so that's why I said, I own it. I'm sorry. I will always be sorry. 
it's hard. It's it things come up when players make mistakes on the floor or away from the floor. And it's up to the professionals, um, whether it be me and the way I react to what a reporter says or the way that a reporter acts to someone doing something on the floor or off the floor. I, I, I do. It's so hard to say because I'm the one who made the mistake. I, and I'm thankful from the, for the behind the scenes stuff. It, it was just, it was really brutal for a long time, but you know, I, I own it and that's what it is. I can't change the way people interpreted, interpreted it at the time. And I'm okay with that. And I have to live with that. And I, I have also seen not necessarily like people recant their statements or something, but to say like, you know what? He didn't do this in front of a camera. This was like almost two years away from a camera while meeting with and talking with very powerful people in the Jewish community and keeping in contact with the league and, and but keeping it totally under wraps. I'm proud of that. And I, I do feel good about it. I, gosh, I, I still, it's going to be a thorn in my side for the rest of my life. I just, I, it's like I said to Shap. Oh my gosh, I just feel like I'm living in a bad dream, man. Like there is no way. But again, it happened for me. I've learned. I've, I've met so many amazing people. Like I said, I've gone to uh, therapy. That changed my life. I finally got out of this deep-rooted pain of my father being gone. Because wow. of this, I never would have gone. Guys, I never would have gone. I have, you can look it up on Google. I've done very well playing basketball. I've taken care of a lot of people, but I'm doing well. Okay. Let's call it for what it is. But that didn't mask. It was just like a band aid. Every time I felt pain, I played bad. My wife was upset with me. Uh, I, you know, I did whatever I would, whatever cool car, uh, who go shopping. I, and that's not me. I'm just a normal guy. But here I was like living in this alternate reality of sorts and boom, sorry for the loud, punch there it's like life hit me all at once but now whew, i'm wow. like i'm getting goosebumps i'm like so at ease we we have a baby boy now he's about to turn a one year old in a week Beautiful. my wife and i are so strong and so connected same with my friends same with people in the jewish community like all of the pain and all of the uh, like sorrow for making such a big mistake is all Somehow turned itself around, and I just, exactly. I just kind of roll with the punches in life, if you will. And hearing you say it, 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 it seems to be so clear. You know, when someone's really at peace with themselves, it's so much easier to be at peace with other people. Oh. And we give people the benefit of the doubt. And you know, I, I can hear a lot of people in your shoes saying, "Yeah, you know, the media and they're critical, and okay, you know, we're just human beings." But you take exactly the opposite side, which is, okay, we all have to be responsible for our actions, but person can only have that attitude if they really are responsible for their own actions, then they can, right, see the, that other people have the best in mind, you know, but it's not just media. I want to ask you quickly, like, like today in the world of social media, again, I'm sure, I, I guess the first question is, do you even follow, you know, what people say about you on social media? And again, do you think there's a line there that's crossed that sometimes that people use their words when they're talking about people in the public arena, like yourself, um, that that people just don't realize what they're saying, and and do you think that that there's a line there's crossed, or do you think it's the same thing? You're in the public arena; people can just say whatever they want. This is a bit different. I would say that people certainly cross a line because there's no accountability. Oftentimes, now if you're verified or people know exactly who you are and you're still willing to say it, then there's a little bit more um, accountability, if you will, or like this is exactly who I am and this is what I'm saying. There are very hurtful things that are said on social media to any and everybody. I personally believe that social media is almost ruining the world as we know it. We want more likes on an Instagram post or a Facebook or a, a tweet than what we're like realizing in, in, in real time in front of us. You, how many times do you guys go to dinner? Let's be honest. Anybody who's listening, and you look at a table and three out of the four people are looking at their phone. Like we have totally lost the ability to communicate and love each other face to face. And, and it, it's brutal. It is. Like I said, the nasty messages that my wife was getting for quite a long period of time still gets them occasionally. So do I. Um, and again, I own it. I 
people have, I guess, every right to say what they want. And it's just when people are behind their phones or behind the computer screen, it's, it's easy then. But it's just, I will say this, and this is one thing that I've learned. Hurt people hurt people. Don't forget that. When people are going through something, they it's like they deflect and want to almost hurt someone else to build themselves up for a moment in time. And I do see what people say. I do have limitations to certain things on my social media. I don't go on Twitter anymore because it is, it's awful and it can be very hurtful uh, because they say, I, I think they did like a, some sort of research on it. It could be like a hundred positive comments to one negative and that one negative will phoom, just drop your confidence. Like you would not believe like say, say a young male athlete and he's feeling good about what he's doing. And someone says, Oh, you're no good. That might just crush his dreams or the same thing. Young female athlete, she's feeling good about everything she's doing. And boom, someone says something so mean for no reason. And it just crushes you, man. And it, and it, it used to be worse, but as you commented just a minute ago, um, about being at peace, I know now like, okay, I'm happy with the man that I am and I will continue. I, we will, I, I will certainly make more mistakes for the rest of my life. I am not perfect. I, I never will claim to have been, but I, I feel good about the man that I am and the, and the way that I love people and my family and will continue to positively impact people until the day that I die. And so it's hard to not look at, and I'm hopeful that other people will understand that there is so much more to this world than social media because it can be just brutal. Definitely. Looks like we're getting near the end of our time here, but I just wanted to reiterate for those who don't know, a lot of a big emphasis of our campaign is about gossip and how we speak about others. So I wanted to ask you, Myers, do you feel like reporters often ask you gossip about other information about other players? Are they asking you for personal information about other players that you find maybe inappropriate? And how do you navigate that? Oh, well, it can be very tricky. So uh, yes, this oftentimes does happen. And it's not necessarily always malicious from um, a, the journalist or the writer's standpoint. That wouldn't be fair to say. Um, but oftentimes, unless I feel confident in what I'm saying, and it, certainly if they're asking something positive about a teammate, sure, of course you want to re, re, uh, respond and, you know, uh, uplift your teammate or whomever it may be. But sometimes, of course, then they'll try to come to you with um, something negative. Hey, I heard this happened or I heard that, you know, so-and-so doesn't like the coach or this or that. That's when it takes one comment or one teammate, one negative energy to, to turn into two players or three players or four or to get one comment out to the media and boom, all of a sudden it turns into something it's not supposed to be. And that's where you have to be very careful. And yes, it does happen. Uh, gossip is, is a tough thing to navigate. It really is. And, and school, let's call it for what it is, elementary school, up to middle school, to high school and college and professional sports uh, in a workplace, in an office environment. It's hard. It's like, all of a sudden one person doesn't like you for some reason and they start saying things that aren't true. And then it's like, wait a minute, this, that's not who I am. Who made that up? Wow. You know? So that, and that is unfortunately a bit of what I felt. And again, I'll reiterate for the, for the, I don't know, hundredth time I own everything that happened. Uh, but it was hard to see the way that some people were judging me when they didn't know me personally. And that's why I'll, I'll even say real quick. Uh, Cause I know we're running out of time. People have come to me with like a negative thing about such and such player. Why do you think he's out of the league? Or, you know, why did he get, what do you think about his suspension? And I say, I don't know him personally. I'm not commenting on that because I don't know him as a man. Yes. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to tear him down. Go to him and ask him. Maybe he made a simple mistake and we're all seeing this the wrong way. Or maybe somebody made that up. Have you ever thought of that? So gossip is and can be very negative, very detrimental. And so that's why, I won't do it. Even players, let's say that I've had run-ins with, let's say maybe a, a double tech or something, just because emotions were heated. Hey, Myers, what do you think about him? He's a real jerk. Huh? I'm like, I don't know him. And I've actually heard pretty good things about him. And some, a lot of times people will say, oh, well, that's cool. All right, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. But guess what? If I had said, yeah, you know what? Forget him. Then all of a sudden that just turns into something it wasn't supposed to be. So 
it's amazing, you know, also in, um, in, in Jewish thought about gossip, you know, even we say, even if it's true, don't say it, mm. right? If it's a lie, of course, but even if it's true, and that's what you said, because something could be true, but like you said, sometimes there's a, a greater purpose, the team, right? The unit coming together, being able to play together. For some of us who are not professional basketball players, right? It could be our family. It could be our, 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 in our work, right? Something could be true, but if it tears people apart, then you can't accomplish the bigger goal that you're trying to accomplish. So it's so powerful. You said, okay, I have one last question that I want to ask you because I was thinking, okay, what am I going to ask it? You know, basketball player speech, you know, we're talking about trash talking on mm -hmm. the court, right? Tra so I'm not, I'm not going to ask you who's the best trash talker. That would maybe go into the, the areas of gossip, right? Maybe some, maybe I'd be interested in some of the best trash talk you've heard. Um, but, but really the question is, do you look at that as negative speech? Like, is that something that's, it's on the court. It's just in, in the moment or even now, like through what you've gone through, is that something that you temper or you feel could even go into the realm of being inappropriate? So there's a couple layers to this. Number one, we often say as like basketball players, when it's between the lines, as long as it's not disrespectful, it like kind of gets you fired up sometimes like that competitive edge, you know, a little trash talk here and there, as long as it doesn't cross the line of say, talking about somebody's family or again, like really hateful speech or really just ugly words, if you will. Um, but yeah, there, there's a line. That's just what it is. Um, there's sometimes you'll see a couple guys, you know, chirping and boom, that gets the crowd going. That gets both, you know, both benches are so locked in and, you know, you see it in the playoffs and, you can just see the look on these guys' faces. And it's like, man, I love watching this. But then sometimes you, you can see like more negative stuff happening and you're like, oh boy, this isn't good. So, you know, there, there's definitely a time and a place for it. Everyone loves to compete. Come on. Well, again, when you're between the lines, it's almost like when you walk out of the lines, you're like, hey, good game. Catch you next time. And you'll, you'll catch NBA players saying that like, uh, again, maybe a reporter tries to start almost like some gossip, like, Hey, I saw you guys chirping and this and that. And it's almost like they're trying to get you to say something negative. And we're, we're sometimes just like, no, it's not that way at all. We were just competing. We're good now, you know? And so again, there's a line, um, but it's important to understand that line. And, and the more mature you get, the more years of experience you have. So again, that's, that's why someone like me, whether it be on the floor or off the floor, you hear something that maybe crosses that line. You got to say something. Cause you have that duty, that responsibility to be like, Hey, I want to let you know, like probably shouldn't say that. Yeah. You know, that sort of thing. So amazing. Okay. We have to wrap up Myers. You gained a lot of fans. Uh, we are all rooting for you, no matter what team you're on, hopefully Chicago bulls at some point, but no matter what team you're on, we, we're, we're, we're really rooting for you and cheering for you because you know, like we said before, we, we see your humanity. We see your love for so many people, for everyone. And, and, and to me, the most, mostly that, that, uh, like I said before, you, you, you hit rock bottom, but you picked yourself up and, and you've impacted so many people in such a positive way. And that's inspired us. That's inspiring so many people. You should be able to continue to inspire so many people, thousands, millions of people that you, you really have a platform to inspire and, uh, and we're rooting for you. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us for everybody who's watching out there. Uh, like I said before, Aish has all kinds of great content that we're putting out, whether you're watching us on YouTube and are in listening in our podcast platforms, follow us, subscribe to us, uh, come, come uh, hear all the great content that we're putting out. Alex, any last words about a clean speech? I just want to thank you so much, Myers, for joining us and for speaking so authentically and vulnerably about what you went through and how you prevailed and came out on top. You really embody what the clean speech challenge is all about. And we're so blessed to have gotten the chance to hear from you tonight. If this interview has inspired anybody listening to want to improve their own speech and follow in the footsteps of Myers, you can sign up for your own 30-day detox from negative speech at cleanspeech.com slash NYC. I won't, I won't get long into to finish. Thank you guys so much. It's such an incredible opportunity. Every time I have an opportunity like this to impact as many people as I can uh, through a very negative moment in my life, which has now turned into a very positive thing. And so you guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Myers, for joining us. Thank you, everybody. See you next time.